Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started to our our Sim Sign Fridays. Can you believe it? We only have three more lectures after this one. So it's I can't believe I was just talking to some people in the lobby how quickly it's all going by the semester. Um, it looks like we have our class here today, Hume 20. Before I begin, I want to encourage any students who are sitting in the back to come down. There are some seats down here. There's plenty because there's going to be an exercise later that we're going to need you next to each other. Um, so you all know me. I'm Lisa Wymore. I'm the faculty advisor for Berkeley Arts and Design, which is part of the Discovery Initiative. Berkeley Arts and Design connects and um, fortifies creative departments and units throughout the Berkeley campus. And funds for these talks are made by um, possible by generous philanthropic donations to Berkeley Arts and Design. Um, unique to the speaker series is our Humanities 20 class, um, which I just mentioned. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from a wonderful group called CREATE um, here on the campus. And CREATE stands for Creative Residencies for Emerging Artists Teaching Empowerment. Um, they're going to be talking about art in the post-COVID classroom. We'll be hearing stories and anecdotes from members of CREATE who have taught online and are tra transitioning to in-person this past year, um, how education um, exacerbated disparities um, and how we can close those disparities now. Um, they'll be sharing an interactive activity and talking about all the ways in which you can get involved with CREATE. Um, CREATE is part um, of the Public Service Center, and they uh, offer classes and enrichment classes for young people in creative writing, dance, theater, and visual arts. Um, they bring these classes to schools and communities that lack funding in the Berkeley and Oakland area. They promote creative expression and exploration through meaningful community engagement. In addition, they strive to create an interdisciplinary creative community among Cal students. So those of you who are interested in learning more about CREATE, we wanted to invite them here uh, so you can join their incredible community. Um, this talk is co-presented by the Associated Students of UC and the Public Service Center as well as CREATE. Um, and then, of course, BAM PFA, our, our home where we host these talks. Before we begin, I just want to recognize that UC Berkeley is located in the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded lands of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County and the confederated villages of Lashan. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. This event is going to be recorded and it will be available on the A plus D YouTube site, as you all know, one week past after this. So next Friday it will become available and we'll have closed captioning available. So if you know anyone that um, needs that service, please feel free to share. And then we'll be doing a Q&A after the class. So make sure to fill out your cards and um, we'll have all the folks here who are presenting come and answer questions for you all. So I'd like to invite up to the stage Tanya Tang, who is part of the visual arts programming and is the program manager at CREATE, um, or she's going to introduce the visual arts part. So welcome. Um, thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. Uh, I'm Tanya. I'm one of the program managers for CREATE. Uh, and like she said, we're here to talk about what it's like to teach art, in, and especially after um, emerging from the pandemic. Uh, and what we do is we pair student teachers, so these are uh, UC Berkeley students, to teach um, lessons in visual arts, creative writing, uh, theater, and dance in schools in Berkeley. Um, these include elementary and middle schools. And since CREATE was founded in 2011, uh, we have promoted creative expression and artistic exploration for both student teachers and students. Um, we reach at least 200 students per semester, some semesters reaching um, more than 300 students. Um, we have had 225 student teachers in the past, um, over these past 11 years. Um, and we started t uh, having teaching artist mentors from the community. These are people working in arts and education, and they come in our trainings to help the student teachers with things like classroom management skills and curriculum development. And we have served 15 sites, and uh, like I said before, this includes elementary schools, middle schools, and certain community centers, such as, um, I think there was chapter 511. 
Uh, and through our classes and our partnerships, we have empowered students uh, by fostering community in classroom spaces. And ultimately our goal is to connect um, UC Berkeley and uh, the community via these uh, through an interdisciplinary creative community. Um, besides our after school um, lessons, we also have a couple other partnerships related to art. Uh, we work with the Berkeley Art Studio to help them host the monthly Craft or Dark events. Uh, last semester, for example, we did things like Trinky Dinks and Needle Felting. And for those, we're just helping out um, UC Berkeley students uh, try a new craft. Um, we also uh, partner with the uh, TDPS um, department to give Create student teachers the option to teach Create classes for units. Um, they can earn one unit pass, no pass. Uh, and uh, like I said before, we work with uh, teaching artists in the community to help foster um, teaching skills in our student teachers. Um, this summer, we're gonna be doing a free arts education enrichment program called Summer Bears, uh, working with the Berkeley Unified School District and Berkeley uh, Rep. And in the past, we've also worked with other student orgs such as uh, Spectrum and Bridging Berkeley, which is another PSC organization uh, to host various workshops um, and incorporate art into their work. And uh, this is also a partnership uh, with Berkeley Arts and Design. And the pandemic hit Create Hard. Um, speaking from personal experience, it's really not fun to learn online. Uh, and it's really hard for uh, like, especially elementary students to focus when they're being taught through um, the screen, right? And it's also really hard to teach um, something as hands-on as art through Zoom. And so we sort of directed our energy more towards other roles um, other than uh, teaching kids. Uh, so for example, we created a zine called Apart with Art, and in it we just, uh, we have very spreads that uh, reflect on the COVID teaching experience. And uh, since last semester, we've returned to in-person teaching. Uh, thankfully, we currently have 14 uh, mostly new uh, student teachers. Um, they are amazing, and they will be talking, some of them will be talking about the work that they do. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to be turning this to the various disciplines and their um, teaching artist mentors. They're going to be talking about uh, what art and teaching means to them, why they do the work that they, that they do, and how they've managed to rebuild um, after the pandemic, starting with uh, Lena, who is our visual arts teaching arts mentor. Hi, my name is Lena, and I have many different labels. I am an artist who display paintings at different places. I am an educator and a teaching artist who teach children at different places in Bay Area. Today, I want to talk about why visual art is important for children and possibility and potential for art class ideas. Why? Because this it's a tough time. Art needs more than any other time. Art is a visual language. First of all, 33% of children are visual learners. That means that's how, I mean, 33% children are visual learners. That's how humans are programmed to learn from the beginning. One out of three children, they are able to learn better based on visual image, rather than reading a text or listening. Painting or sculpture can convey ideas or evoke specific kind of emotional responses. Well, have you ever experienced being moved or feel touched by a painting at museum? Or you don't know why, but the painting makes you feel like you want to cry 
or it makes you so comforting and you feel so relaxed. Hopefully, yes, you had felt that way at least one time of your life. If you're not, I'm sorry. Okay, so let me give another example. Have you heard about like color theories or color in emotions? Like blue and green makes you calm and relax, red makes your heartbeat race, and alert, alert. Have you heard about like beautiful pink gel? No? Well, there was a cool down pink project in Switzerland to reduce aggression in inmates. Psychologists carefully decided to paint the jail with a beautiful pink color, including jail walls, walls and cells. A lot of prisoners, of course, they complained, but it worked. The number of fights decreased. I mean, imagine you are surrounded by beautiful pink. You are probably less motivated to fight. That's the power of color. Art can be a great way to express your thoughts, feelings, and identity in a way that can be universally understood. Well, perhaps a symbol, a heart, you will probably agree, love, fulfill, warm. Art enhances self-esteem. Well, have you ever, have you, um, have you anyone painted or drawn when you're sad or stressed out? Or has, or has anyone said to you, oh, painting makes me happy? Yes, painting makes you happy because you can express your feelings and emotions through the paintings that you cannot verbally describe. Visual art helps children's development. Art stimulates both sides of brain. Do you, um, have you heard about right side brain versus left side brain things? I'm not a um, best person to explain to you because I'm an artist, not a science teacher. But let me tell you, right side of brain controls memories, motion, and creative things. And the left side brain is more for logic and objective things. So when you start a painting, you need to visualize the finer painting, how it looked like in your mind. That's the right side of your brain is working. And when you're developing the painting, such as choosing the elements, colors, that's still right side of brain. But at the same time, you need to be able to look critically at what you painted and where you want to add next brush stroke with what color. That is left side. Art develops, oh, studies show that children who do art read better and in a math and science. Of course, you practice both sides of brain. Art develops hand and eye coordination. So when you paint or draw, your brain controls and commands how you want to move your hands while your eyes relay message back to your brain with what you've done and what you need to do. Visual art is more than just art. Art teaches open-ended thinking. It presents a question rather than answers. Art is not like a math or science. There can be a multiple different answers. It could be multiple different questions. Art teaches children that they can be more than one solution to the same problem. Art teaches children how to engage in a creative problem solving. When art is integrated with other curriculum area, children become more engaging in the learning process. I wanna say art is very versatile subject that you can mix with a lot of different um, subject. And art class is necessary to teach how to paint the perfect portrait or amazing painting techniques for still life painting. You can mix different subjects with um, visual art, perhaps history and culture with art, science with art, music with art.
And today I prepare a quick art activities, and I want you to open your mind about art class ideas and potentials. So we are going to draw a music. I'm going to play a music, and you're going to draw based on what you heard. Okay. Anyone have um, drawing supplies, pens, and papers? So we have a limited time and we have a limited supply. So we're going to draw a line with music. Anyone how to know how to draw a straight line? How about dot or dash? Wavy or zigzag? Do you think line has a rhythm? Maybe, yes or no? Okay, let's see. The first music that I'm going to play is this. Do you think what kind of line is the best fit for this one? Okay, the second one is... And third one... Can you show me your drawings for me? Have anyone drawn the same line for first three different music? It's all different. Maybe because you're built differently. And the last one is a little long. So if you're able to create a line with this one, I believe you can create a beautiful artwork based on this music. Ready? I'm so sorry. Yes, I am an art teacher, not a computer major, <laughs> for sure.
you guys feel like, oh, I wish I have some color crayons or better like uh, drawing supplies? I know this is a very limited um, art activity because obviously we don't have tons of art supplies here. But how about if I ask you to draw something else, not just about lines? Do you guys, do you think you can create some artwork too? Yeah. Art is very versatile. For just like a small little activity, you can twist 100 different ways. You can ask, maybe like, let's draw shapes and music. Or maybe you can, maybe let's draw some free drawings based on the music. And doesn't necessarily be a music. Like maybe you can give us a mystery item inside of back and ask a student, oh, can you touch and feel it? And do you think you can able to draw? Yeah. And the next activity, maybe I don't have enough time for this, but I want you to give this one as a homework to think about it. I want to give a credit to Children's Creativity Museum because that's how I got this class idea. So I want you to think how you can solve the problem and what you want to, what you can make out of this. You are pet dragon at a shooting star by accident me. Now he can stop sneezing with a fire because of shooting star allergy. Find a way to safely give allergy medicine to dragon. Well, maybe you want to draw some, maybe you want to create a, some, a drone or some small airplane that you can control. Or maybe you want to draw some um, special air suit that can fire resist. There's a hundred different way how children think. And based on the age, you can always give different challenge. Like you can always ask, oh, today let's draw a beautiful house. But how about this upside down house? How about house under the water while all the sea animals alive? How about a house that from a tiny little hamster to big elephant can live together? Visual art is not just about paintings and drawings. It is a self-expression. It needs to be nurtured to creativity. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Alexis. I'm one of the student teachers at CREATE, and I work with first and second graders um, at Washington Elementary. So today I'm going to be talking about the Lois Milo Jones art project that we did a couple weeks back. So a quick intro to the project, we decided that in honor of Black History Month, um, we would have the kids do an art project based on the work of Lois Milo Jones, who is an incredible African-American artist, in order to expose them more to um, work that is done by Black artists, as well as give them a chance to express their creativity a little bit. So we always have um, a step-by-step -step instruction for ourselves as well as for the kids to keep the classroom orderly, um, but to also help give them some freedom as well. So here, as you can see, the steps are pretty simple, um, just to sketch out the mask, um, color it in with oil pastels or markers or any other materials that they chose, to cover the entire page with black pastel and then scratch off um, the mask shape with a toothpick. Um, we thought that the idea of uncovering the mask would be really good uh, for the kids to sort of um, get the feeling of sort of revealing what they'd already done. Um, here you can see the project in action. We uh, blurred the kids' faces for privacy, but they had a lot of fun with it. Um, as you can tell, they all chose different colors. Some chose to cover the entire page in black, some didn't. Um, some wanted to make more than one mask, so they had a lot of um, freedom in this activity. Um, and to take a look at the impact, in more general terms, we got to see the kids interact with African-American-inspired art, which they don't really get a chance to do um, with in the normal um, or usual curriculum, which is highly Eurocentric um, and sometimes lacking in general. Uh, they also got to express their creativity since they got to play with a range of different mediums and materials, uh, and they weren't really given super specific instructions on how they're supposed to conduct this art project, um, so that was really great to see. But more specifically, on an individual level, um, 
each child had their own experience with uh, doing this art project and um, a quick anecdote from um, my experience teaching this project to the kids. Uh, one of them got a little bit frustrated after covering his entire page in the black pastel. He wanted to go back. He wasn't very happy with how it looked. But after encouraging him to see it more as like now he has a new drawing to work on where he can use the toothpick to sort of scratch out new designs, he was able to, um, you know, draw some butterflies, some stars, some flowers, some swirls and stuff. Um, and he decided that he liked it a lot more than his original drawing. And this is just um, one student, but this sort of experience goes across the entire like 20 kid classroom that we work with. Um, everyone had their own challenge that they had to overcome. Um, they kind of had their own fun experience with it. So it was just really great to see. And it sort of brings us to the idea that Create allows us to have an observable impact on each student's lives, um, as well as allowing them to express their unique creativity and vision. Um, and to be involved with that is really rewarding and pretty amazing. So I'm gonna be passing it off to Grace. Um, my partner. <laughs> uh, hi, um, I'm Grace. Um, I'm a sophomore majoring in econ and geography, and I teach with Alexis at Washington, uh, teaching first and second graders. And I'm going to teach about another activity that we did that was like my personal favorite, uh, making a slime out. So here's a screenshot of our project where you could see all the information. Um, and I think the value of this project just comes from showing how art and science can come together, which gives students more ways to be able to express themselves and their creativity. Uh, one thing I think is really important when you're teaching young students is to show them how art and the values and the skills that you can learn can be transferred to you know, other disciplines or whatever passion um, that the kids may have since not everyone's going to be passionate about art, but art can lend itself to other disciplines and enrich those. And then another example of that is helping students to build the problem-solving skills. Um, in order to conduct the experiment, the kids had to decide, do I need more contact solution or do I need more baking soda? And in the end, it's very individualistic and it's up to each student. And then I think another interesting thing about this project is how uh, the students were able to find a way to regulate their emotions. Uh, generally, art is very much about letting students find their own way to express themselves. But when you combine that with other disciplines, I think it, you know, lets student lets students have an insight into um, other things that they can do with that. So yeah, and here is some photos of the results. Um, as you could see, although each student was given the same materials, what came out of that was very like specific and individual to each student. Um, and I think that shows really just the value of art and not only enabling kids to you know build the skills that they could use to you know follow their passions or whatever that, whatever that may lead them, but uh, but also in showing them that their individual expression is unique to them. Yeah, and now I'm going to pass it off to Min Min, and she's just going to share a little bit about her um, experience teaching. Hello, my name is Min Min, and I'm a first-year student studying math, econ, and education. I'm a create visual arts teacher at Berkeley Arts Magnet School, like two blocks down. Um, so, art is often seen as a form of escape, which it absolutely can be. When I was as young as the kids that I teach, I had a difficult home life and art indeed was an escape for me. Growing up, I was very closed off, but as I got older, my relationship with art changed and it became more of a way to connect with others rather than close myself off. Now, as a create teacher, I see more than ever that art truly functions as a great form of connection for my students. So one lesson which my teaching partner Kohala created is a fantastic way for students to work together as a community. Basically, we split the class into two groups um, with one folding origami leaves and then the other group folding um, origami flowers. And then we had a student in each group find a partner in the other group and teach them the new skill they had learned. Together, they were able to learn two new skills along with how to teach and collaborate with one another. Finally, we put all the flowers and leaves together for them to enjoy the garden that they had created. Ultimately, art is like this garden that they created. Think about the last time you went to a museum. Was it only one painting or two? 
My guess is probably not. It was probably a collection of art from a wide variety of artists who each found inspiration and learned skills from another artist at some point in their career. From the beginning of time, our civilization's collection of art has been like a garden, cultivated by artists of each generation learning from the ones before them. And in our kindergarten classroom in Berkeley, our students acted in the same spirit, nurturing their garden as a collective of little artists. And next is theater. Thank you. These are different overalls. I want to make that clear. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Adrian. I'm the uh, performance slash theater teacher. Kind of like messing with the mic. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, you know, guys, we did it post COVID. We did it. Um, so, you know, I went to Berkeley. I did a lot of like performance clubs. I majored in theater. Uh, I was originally film. Uh, I do improv, stand up. You know, I have a show Friday night, tonight, 9 p.m. in the city. It's called Your Fucked Up Relationship, part of Endgame's Improv. It's really cool. Um, hey, so imagine this. It's like, you know, there's a global rise of fascism. Inequality is at an all-time high. Uh, you know, tensions are just rising. There's a deadly pandemic. What do you need? An outlet, right? Now... Performance can be an outlet. It can be cathartic. It can be, you know, a way not only to meet other people and socialize, which is, you know, very essential in the post-COVID world, uh, especially with kids who I feel like it's been, what, two, three years? So it's like, you know, a lot of those, like, social skills have been, like, lost that were, like, you know, fostered. Sorry. That one was an accident. So, yeah, um, performance can be an outlet. If not, it's bottled up. You know, and it, there's no way to get it out. Uh, and then not only that, but also Zoom. Teaching performance on Zoom is bad. It's not fun, especially because there's a lot of movement. And because my emphasis is mainly like improv stuff, you really have to move a lot. Now, not only is performance already, you know, like a rampant. So, okay, so. Comedy can be a voice for the oppressed. Comedy can be a voice for the, you know, the marginalized. It could be the court jester standing up valiantly to the, to the king being like, you're a fucking idiot and we don't have water. And that's why they're fine. It can't be that. But it is also the most patriarchal, classist, and racist institution, art institution in the world. I mean, Louis C.K. won a Grammy last week. Yeah. So throw in having a good internet connection and a Zoom account and a good computer. Yeah, even more inequality. Okay, I'm kind of running out of time. So I'm going to make you talk to each other. Uh, so, you know, partner up with someone. So like I said, I teach improv. And in improv, it's, you know, you fail together and you succeed together as a team. You know, it's not your scene, it's not my scene, it's our scene. And so, you know, you're putting building blocks together, you know. And so one of the main ideas is the idea of yes ending. So it's like, let's say, uh, here's your drink, Mr. Bond. Uh, the other person can't be like, what are you, you're a cat, you're in space, why are you talking? Where does that scene go? Nowhere. Now it's... Here's your drink, Mr. Bond. Um, did you check for cyanide? See, you're building a narrative. Yeah? Okay, so what I want you to do is talk to the person next to you and just kind of yes and something, you know? Maybe like, I went to the store, and then the next person could be like, yeah, uh, did you see the cat that lives there? And you know, just like keep going. Try not to, uh, you know, I'm not gonna give you too much rules. Just yes and each other. Uh, for like three minutes, and then I want to see how you guys feel. Yeah? Cool. Talk to each other.
Okay, how'd that feel? Just shout it out. Just how'd that feel? Funny, fun, cool, yeah? You have a best friend now? Cool. All right, so uh, next is Raksha. Uh, she's great. They're all great. Hi, guys. My name is Raksha. I'm a first year. I'm a intended public health major, but I also love to teach, and I did a ton of performing arts in high school, and I'm in performing arts groups on campus as well, which is why I got into teaching performing arts with CREATE. So me and my partner, Andrea, we teach at the Berkeley Arts Magnet School, and we sort of do like a mix of things. We teach singing, and we teach dancing. We just sort of let the kids have fun. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how the classroom looks different, especially in performing arts post-COVID. And one of the things I wanted to talk about is I know we've all remembered like in first grade when our teacher would promise us like an end of the year party if we like raise enough bottle caps or something like that. And they'd bring in pizza and they'd bring in like chips and drinks and we'd have this like giant party at the end of the year. And a couple weeks ago, it was like, three different studi students' birthdays all in the same week. So I was like, oh, I'll bring in cookies and I'll bring in chips and we'll do a cute little party. And then I went into the classroom and I realized that like those parties don't exist anymore, really. Like there were so many rules and they were like, okay, we can't like eat in the classroom. So you're going to have to put like your food in your bag and just eat it when you go home alone. And I was like, that's so sad because when I was growing up and I had those parties in class, I'd look forward to it all week. And I'd be so excited to talk to all my friends and have a good time. And so just recognizing that these students have less and less opportunities to connect with each other in these new forms of classroom and making sure that we're able to give them other outlets to connect with each other because they're missing out on things like parties and playtime and these classroom activities that normally would happen. And then another thing that my partner and I like to do is we start off every class where we all sit in a circle and we go around and we say one thing that made us smile that week. And it's super cute. A lot of them have the same answer because they've been doing class together all week. But some of them say they went to go see their sister or they went to go see their grandparents or their family went out to dinner. And it's really sweet. But one thing that I've noticed when we do this circle is the attention span that these kids have. Like one kid will be talking and then a kid all the way down at the other end of the circle will start speaking over the kid. And my partner and I will have to figure out how to like make sure that every kid's voice is heard. And part of me wonders if that attention span has something to do with the fact that these kids have been learning online for a whole two years where really they're not sitting in a classroom with other students, they're just at home alone. So they don't have to learn these skills of, okay, well, I need to wait my turn. I need to listen to my classmate talk. Because when you're learning online, all they can do is just get up from their computer and like go run around if they're bored. And so this attention span is also something that my partner and I have had to navigate through in this post-COVID classroom. And just making sure that we're able to facilitate those skills in our students, making sure that even though they did lose a lot of time developing these essential skills, that we help build them back up for these students. And now I will invite Andrea up. Okay, so I'm gonna take this off. So my partner Raksha covered a lot of the challenges that we've been facing in this post-COVID classroom, and one of them, I think, especially when it comes to performing arts, has been the masks. We know that the masks protect us, but with children, and especially in the realm of performing arts, they also create a sort of blockade for what we use most when we're performing, which is our bodies and our faces. And so when I was a little kid, I would get so angry at my mom for even putting pigtails in my head. As soon as she'd put them on, I'd leave the house, I'd get to school, I'd go to the bathroom and take them right out. I was like, I can't 
stand this, this is uncomfortable. And so a lot of the memories I have from being a little kid are very specific to having freedoms like this. I could express myself in a very physical way and a lot of the ways that I wanted to be and be very um, autonomous over how I wanted to look in the classroom. But today, childhood, it looks very, very different than it did to any of us. And a lot of that has to do with something that kids do a lot, which is express with their faces and their bodies, gets covered up with the mask and they are told to wear that all day and as children they don't understand as far to the extent as we do of what this does for us in a COVID time and so seeing them frustrated and upset and getting very anxious having to wear a mask on it puts us in a position as teachers as having to remind them we have other ways of expressing with ourselves and our bodies particularly with performance that make having a mask and sometimes a challenge but also maybe an aid to showing us how our bodies do a lot more for us than we really put up. Um, so the first day me and Raksha had gone to Berkeley Arts Magnet, we were so excited sitting there waiting for them to come in, but um, I can't say that I wasn't a little shocked just because I wasn't actively thinking about seeing 20 little kids with tiny little rainbow masks and just them like kind of hanging off their faces and their nose and while it's no new thing to us to see masks, again, for me, remembering childhood in a very specific way to myself from experience and seeing it, what it is to them now, it was a little shocking. But as we warmed up and as the weeks went on and as we kept meeting with them, I saw that that challenge presented a different way that we express ourselves to one another. And why is that? A lot of these kids from the very beginning, like she said, are coming from a time where their attention was kept to a screen and they didn't have to like, worry about a mask. They had to worry about a camera on. And now they're put into this situation where they feel, again, in a way that they don't understand as well, like confined and they don't feel like they can be expressive but as we've shown them each week with our activities and like mainly just focusing on bodily movements and how expressing your feelings your thoughts your passions through the way that you move your body is a different way that you can do that and be still a fully expressive human being in the sort of conditions that we are very necessary today and a lot of that has been very fun just seeing them really delve into the dance side um and Kanto is just absolutely having them on a chokehold right now. The amount of times I've listened to the Bruno song is not okay, but I don't hold back on playing it every time because watching them be able to replicate every single dance move from the movie and you see them very focused on like the way they bend their heads and they move their arms you see that even subconsciously they're looking at the way that bodily movement and expression is a really big outlet for them and seeing them be able to you know kind of move away from the sort of frustration they feel and they express sometimes like I just want to take my mask off it's hot in here I don't like this and being like I know like I totally get that like I'm not going to say I'm here all the time like sometimes smelling my own breath or just like having the stuff on my ears is the most comfortable thing but to these kids helping sort of guide them in this new world and teach them in a way that shows them there are so many ways to be you has been a really rewarding and fulfilling part of being part of create and being in this post-covid classroom thank you Oh, uh, yeah, uh, next is Ella, uh, creative writing, also great. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ella. Um, I'm the creative writing mentor for Create this semester. Um, I am also a Berkeley alum. I graduated in 2015, um, which if you're a current undergrad probably sounds like it was one billion years ago because it basically was. Um, I actually was also a Create program manager 10 years ago when I was a sophomore. So it's really awesome to be here um, and to see the program continuing to thrive and to grow and to hear all the really, really great experiences that the Create community members have been having. Thanks everyone for, for sharing so far. And thank you everyone here um, for being here and listening to us. Uh, I think I don't take it for granted to have a space to get to talk about art, especially in today's day and age. So really appreciative to be here. Um, Arielle is one of the creative writing student teachers, but she's not feeling well today, so she couldn't make it. So shout out to Arielle. Hope you're feeling better whenever you watch this recording. Um, with creative writing, I think when people think about creative writing, it can mean a lot of different things. I think often what first comes to mind is something that's like incredibly polished, like a really um, fancy or formal like poem or even like slam poetry performance or a short story or a memoir. Um, but really to me, and I think to a lot of teaching artists, Creative writing just means storytelling, which itself can mean a lot of different things. And storytelling is really all about 
connection, like building a relationship with someone else um, and building empathy. Um, and I wanted to share one of my favorite quotes about storytelling, which is from the Berkeley Story Center, which is the shortest distance between two people is a story. And I think that's the reasoning behind a lot of creative writing and storytelling and art in general is to just bridge that space between two different people or two different kids or a kid and an adult or really just a community. And so in that spirit, um, we're about to get interactive again. Um, so I'm going to give you all about five or six minutes, and I encourage you to turn to someone next to you. It could be the same person who did you did Adrian's improv activity with. Um, but turn to someone next to you. It could be someone you know, someone you don't know. And I'd like to have each person share a story about your first name. So that could be, you know, your legal first name, your middle name, nickname, something secretive, um, your social media handle or your like video game handle. It's really up to you, but just share um, a little bit of a story or your perspective about your name. Um, so I'm gonna give you all about five, six minutes. Um, so both, both people should have a chance to share. Um, so go for it, share your stories. Okay, take about another 30 seconds or so and wrap up.
Okay. How was that for everybody? I've seen some nods, some thumbs up. Yeah, I heard a lot of good conversation starting, so it sounded like it went well. Um, thanks everyone for being down to participate in that. Um, I really like that first name activity. Um, I use it a lot in my own job, which is um, at Voice of Witness, an oral history um, nonprofit organization. I like that activity a lot because I think often when you're working with folks, especially kids, especially young kids, if you're like, tell me a story, they're like, I don't have a story. Like, I don't have anything to share. Um, so this really brings it back to the idea that like everyone does have something simple to share or not simple. So everyone has something to share that might seem simple, but can actually get pretty deep. I'm curious if anyone was surprised by the depth of their conversation just now in five minutes. And, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I feel like often like something as personal as a name, um, it can really be, it can open things up to a very rich, deep vein of conversation. Conversation. Um, so something like this where, you know, everyone has a name, everyone has something they can share. It makes storytelling very um, accessible for students. And it's a good starting point, too, because you don't have to come up with anything too, you know, wild. It's really low pressure and it can be very personalized. And it's also really good to learn people's names, too. So that reinforces that activity when you're starting in the classroom. Um, so I like to, to start there. Um, so with teaching over, over Zoom and in the virtual world, um, I think it's been really important for us, um, you know, in the past as we've been doing Zoom and now it's kind of transitioning to in-person, it's so important to meet students where they're at. And so we really wanted to emphasize the creative process and the creative experience rather than producing a specific product. So again, we don't wanna put that pressure on students to be like, if you are engaging in art or in writing, you have to like turn something in, you have to like show something. Really it's about just having the space together, whether it's virtual in person, is a time where students can you know, be away from the regular, probably like pretty intense or boring like Zoom lectures or like really deadening, boring like Zoom conversations and just have a space to be themselves and also to um, like look inward too. Um, if they're interested about storytelling, um, it can be about how you're feeling, something about your identity or your family or your community. So really creating a space where there's low pressure and you can meet students where they're at. Like if you are in a creative, if you're teaching a creative class and you notice that students are low energy or they're going through something, you can you can ask them about that or you can assess that and kind of adapt and change your lesson plan and change the environment to meet their energy level. So really it's all about um, the experience and it's about building trust and relationships, which can also take time. I think that's really important always for teaching, but is definitely emphasized in the Zoom and virtual world that if you just have, you know, one, the first session might not go, you know, super well, quote unquote, it takes time for people to really get to know each other, for students to get to know you. So just having that patience and that trust um, and also like opening yourself up for possibility in unexpected places. Um, I think it's important to like have a plan when you're going into teaching a class, especially a creative class, but also be ready to throw that plan out the window because you probably will have to. So having activities or questions or other things in your back pocket, being really flexible. Um, because again, this is a really special space for students to just be creative and be themselves, whatever that means. Um, and so I want to give a little bit of an example of an activity that I did, um, not as part of CREATE, but when I was teaching classes with middle schoolers virtually through my work at Voice of Witness. Um, over Zoom, we, um, we introduced this poem by George Ella Lyon, um, which is about, it's called Where I'm From, where the poet just talks a lot, it includes a lot of very rich sensory details about her childhood and growing up and like her family and identity. And so we created this poem that students working in small groups could answer. And again, it's going back to looking inward, um, turning inward and finding those very accessible details about your own life and your own culture and family. So it's not like I have to come up with something totally crazy imaginative off the top of my head, like on the spot, but it's about how do we start with like, what are memories I have? What are like sensory details that I remember or like from childhood or right now? Can I share those? And also, um, that, and it's also emphasizing that those details are important. That is a story. Like the story of someone's life is very meaningful and worth sharing. So here we had things like share, you know, your favorite color or a smell that reminds you of home or talk about someone you care about. So again, like focusing on where students at and 
emphasizing that their world, their relationships, that is creative, that is worth sharing and diving into. Um, for privacy reasons, I don't have um, examples of what the students did, but this is how I answered um, that prompt with the students. I'll just um, point out the, I am from Jurassic Park, um, and the T-Rex ruling the earth once more at the end, because that's one of my favorite movies, Jurassic Park. Um, and after we wrote the poem, we also, um, we tried to complement that storytelling with um, photography and, and other creative mediums. So when we were doing this activity, we then encouraged students to just using like their phones, um, take a photo um, inspired by their poem they wrote. So it's nothing fancy. It's literally just like in your room or at home or anything. And students literally just texted me their photo and in real time I made it like a slideshow. Um, so that was really nice because like, this is this is my photo because um, I love Jurassic Park and that's actually my sister's original Jurassic Park T-Rex that she used to like throw at me um, when we were children. Um, and now her son um, uses it, so it's very sweet. So it, it, this story, this, this photo, in addition to being like kind of silly and fun, actually has a lot of sentimental um, value to me. So again, like just trying to figure out like how, what are ways to complement writing with photography or with like oral storytelling or like other creative mediums. Arielle again couldn't make it today because um, she's not feeling well, but I wanted to share some of her reflections. Um, Arielle's been teaching along with another creative student teacher, Sarah Fang, at Craigmont Elementary School. And um, I'm just gonna share her reflections here. She says that the reason she wanted to work with Create is because art is healing and she's experienced this through creative writing. Teaching creative writing to elementary school students can come with some surprising twists. We have oftentimes found that our students are not inclined to physically produce writing, so we've had to adapt and adopt different modalities of art. This includes visual arts, storytelling, theater, which didn't work super great. I know that they work with very young students, um, and dance. She shares that the, her three biggest lessons learned are meets the students where, they're at, where they are. Um, you're sensing the theme here. Every student learns differently, and art is supposed to be fun and not stressful. Creative writing is art, and we do not need to produce anything tangible to be legitimate, and art is healing. Um, and again, Ariel was, was mentioning how she wanted to combine writing, especially because they were working, I believe, with like first grade students, wanting to combine writing with different modalities of art. So it's really about not confining yourself to like a strict sense of like, this is what writing is, this is what creative writing is, but opening yourself up to adapting, to combining with different like other mediums to, create, to make something creative. So this is a poem collage they worked on. Um, I wanna share that the, the poem on the left, I believe it says, um, it's like, you know, a collage, but I think it says, earth blooms again, everything grows and flows now, winter go away, um, which I think is pretty profound for like a six or seven year old to say. Um, and they also did name poems um, where they, you know, combined art and visual art and paint um, with writing and with students, like, again, going back to their name and their identity, something that's very grounding and important to them. Um, so I just want to share this, uh, this last quote, which is from StoryCorps, um, which is that listening is an act of love. And so I think you could extend that to just the creative process and holding a creative space for students um, is an act of love. So it's about that experience and that relationship building far more than any creative product. Um, but thank you all for, for listening. And now I'm gonna hand it back to our Create Program Managers. Okay, so uh, that concludes our presentation from each discipline. And I hope that everyone was able to get an idea of how arts varies across each discipline and how you know the teaching experience and experience with COVID is uh, unique. Um, and now I'm just gonna share some, uh, just a few announcements and some upcoming events that we have. If you wanna get more involved with Create or um, you just wanna learn more about the arts community at Cal, um, I'm also one of the program managers. So if you have any like questions, you could just come up to me after too. Um, so first, um, First, if you want to make uh, macrame plant, plant hangers, uh, feel free to uh, join us on Thursday. That's April 21st uh, from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. Um, at MLK. Uh, we work with like the art studio at Berkeley to uh, plan these uh, monthly craft or dark events, which are open to all Cal students or any person in the community need to be able to uh, do some fun art projects. And then also on Cal Day, April 23rd, we're helping to bring back Cal Day Kid Zone. Um, 
and that's from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Lower Sproul. We're going to do some like fun activities like you get to make balloon animals um, and do some like tattoos and make slime. So if that sounds fun to you, uh, feel free to join us. And then here's also an interest form uh, if you want to get any more information or get reminders or updates about recruitment for next semester and um, all events coming up. Okay, we're going to move into the Q&A portion of our afternoon. And I just want to thank you all for putting together such an informative presentation for us. That was really wonderful. I just appreciate it so much. Yay. So let's invite all the folks up who want to come up on the stage from CREATE. We have some microphones, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. We have people, ushers, uh, helping and just reminding people to, when you ask a question to use the microphone because this will be recorded. Um, sorry, mask on. So um, for the recording, it's really helpful to have. Um, and the folks who are on the stage, if you want, you can take your mask off because it's we can if that's comfortable for you or keep them on, whatever uh, feels right to you. But because you're on the stage, you can't take it off. All right, so let's begin. Does anyone have a question for CREATE for the folks up here? Yeah, we've got one over here. Thank you. Hi. Um, oh, wow. I'm sorry. Um, I was just wondering, like, I know we briefly, you guys briefly, like, talked about how, like, highly technological upbringings and, like, virtual learning um, and the effects that has on, like, you know, a child mind and, like, specifically in regards to attention span. But, like, on that note, have any of you across your disciplines noted, like, a distinct quality of like the, the types of narratives that these students are tending towards that might be impacted by like virtual learning or increased technology exposure, like based on like compared to the things you might have wanted to build narratives about as a child, do you notice anything different about what these kids are doing and like has the technology impacted the types of stories they're interested in drawing and writing about and performing? Um, yeah. Hello, can you all hear me? Um, yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, I know for me and just my experience working with kids, I feel like, oh, sorry. I feel like um, because ki like, you know, kids as young as like, probably like fetuses have their own phones these days. Um, so I think s young, young students um, and kids are very like tuned into like the news and like global events and like communication, like on a, a global national scale, um, which I think, you know, is a double, can be a double-edged sword, but I think a lot more like global things are on their mind. And also because of like the, you know, pretty unique nature of the last couple of years. So I think, um, young people are just very aware of like social political issues. And so I, sometimes I see that coming into their, their stories that they want to share or like what's on their mind. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I think it, it just shows like, you know, how much they are really thinking about like world events. Is this on? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I think, yeah, but then I also think about, like, when I was a little kid and, like, the events we had and we would also, like, I, that just reminded me. I remember uh, it was, uh, like, cut to, like, 2004. We're in, like, third grade and we're all standing in line and we're all, like, it's the day after the election and we're like, well, my parents voted for Kerry. And then they're like, well, my parents voted for Kerry. And we're like, we're all, we all voted for Kerry. And stuff like that. Uh, was that his name? John Kerry? Is that right? Kennedy looking fellow? Okay, cool. Yeah, and so we were like, oh my God, it was a stolen election. And I just think about how they were like, you know, like even as kids, we were kind of like, you know, we like we have these propaganda machines just kind of like blaring all the time, like the news and stuff like that. Um, yeah, not to trail off too much, but yeah, I do believe we're the most indoctrinated country in the world. So, you know, we are like constantly, even from, a, it starts from a little age. And so it's like, you know, yeah. I have a question for you all. How did you come to get to know Create and how long have you each been involved with it? Uh, yeah, 
Um, we can start with me. Uh, I joined in the second semester of my freshman year. I think I heard about Create from a friend, actually, who was part of Create. Um, but yeah, I started uh, being a student teacher then, and then immediately after the pandemic started, so all of my teaching was through uh, was through Zoom, basically. Um, and since becoming a program manager, I haven't uh, been able to teach, but um, I, I'm still involved with Create. And yeah. Um, is this on? Yeah. I um I found out about Create through like I think like an email newsletter when I was a freshman, and they were looking for program managers, and I was really interested. Um, especially as a first year student to like find more about like the arts and like a public service centered um, opportunity. So I was a program manager then. Um, and then since I've graduated, it's been, I think, a couple semesters that I've been able to return as a mentor. So it's really nice to come back to this community. I'm also the co-lead of the Pro Public Service Center alumni group. So if anyone is connected to the PSC and graduating soon, you should definitely um, look up potentially joining the, the PSC alumni group. So just a little shout out for that. <laughs> Um, I'm a freshman, so this is actually like my second semester doing Create. Last semester, though, I did creative writing, and right now I'm doing visual arts. Hello. I joined this semester, and um, I got an email from Connie Grace and um, Konya. <laughs> Yeah, and I had a chance to work with um, a lady named Connie. We launched um, art competition together, international art competition. So I thought she's mentioned she invited this one, but turns out it was not. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, um, I'm a program manager and a student teacher now. Um, I joined like, I think spring semester of my freshman year. I honestly don't remember how I found out about it. But it was also kind of something that I was like looking for because in high school I'd I'd also like taught art to little kids at this like little like after school program that I used to go to in elementary school. Um, so it was something I was like looking to you know continue during college, and then um, I found Create, and yeah, I became program manager. This is my first semester, but um, I've been teaching for the past like yeah like two, and this is my third. So yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I only graduated like two years ago. Uh, I got to walk the last ones. My roommates all graduated the year after me and they hated when I made that joke. Um, one of my current housemates was a program manager uh, and she knew I like teach improv and all that. And so she like asked me, I joined fall of last year. And so yeah, she like sent me the email and then I applied and I was like, this is cool, yeah. Other questions from our folks here in Hume 20? From your cards or anything? Okay. Uh, I'm curious about the kind of the mentor relationship since we have some uh, professional teaching artists and some student teaching artists um, on the stage. And so what have you been learning from each other? Um, I think one really helpful thing is like classroom management um, and there's also like a lot of like creative like fun art projects that they've showed us I think like a couple weeks ago in my uh, I teach like kindergartners we did something that Lena showed us which is um, well we didn't have her book that she used but it's like a basically a color project and like shapes so like we tell them to draw like everybody draw a triangle and then everybody draw a circle and then everybody draw a rectangle. But then when we all like look at the end product, it all looks different and it's like unique based on how you chose to do it. Yeah, similarly, I feel like Lena, she definitely like inspired me to like, like we did a lesson on like color theory, which like she taught us and it inspired me to, you know, use that in like one of our uh, lessons with the, with the kids at Washington. So I feel like she's just been really helpful in um, helping us be able to like form lesson plans and and learn how to like navigate like you know classroom dynamics. Um, like if we have an issue, um, I've been able to like go to her um, and get some impact, some or some information on you know what I could do better next time and how to handle just different classroom dynamics. Uh, 
Go ahead. Well, I really want to say how much I appreciate and thank you because um, art needs more than any time. And I remember my first day of teaching how I got scared and how nervous, but I'm so amazed how they are able to jump into the class with a bunch of little kids and how they're create, how they're um, do amazing works with kids. I'm so amazed, really. Add that. I feel like I get to learn a lot from the student teachers, especially because with my work, I'm still teaching mainly virtually and not in the classroom as much in person. So I feel like it's been really meaningful to learn from every all of the create teachers, um, like what it's what it's like in the classroom, what challenges they're facing, like when they try something out, like what's the effectiveness, what's the lessons learned. So I think it's very much like a mutual relationship. I think you, uh, yeah, as a teacher, you get so much out of it. Um, I. Yeah, I just think, uh, I tell them often, I'm like, uh, fail early, fail often, because that's how you learn. Um, and so last semester, I didn't, there were actually no theater uh, or performance uh, teaching artists, and so this is my first semester. And so last semester, I was just kind of coming in and giving them like lessons. Uh, and so this semester was my actual first semester with like, uh, um, and so, you know, it was really cool, like, you know, seeing how they were doing it and like, uh, yeah, just like the questions they were asking me and just like, yeah, like, uh, I know one of them thought the kids wouldn't be ready to like perform. Uh, the other one did. And it's just, yeah, it's just like, it was nice, you know, kind of like mediating and like hearing all that and just their experiences. Uh, hello. <laughs> so my question is kind of like on the participation of the children. Um, I have done like very limited experiences, like volunteering with um, helping children do like storytelling projects, I think like first to third graders. And it's like sometimes you find that kids are really shy or like they're really kind of like stubborn about not wanting to participate and like just like really adamant that they don't want to do it. And so do you think that all kids kind of do have like an innate love for art, but it just needs to be coaxed out of them? Or it's like, I don't know, like in your experience, do all kids enjoy doing art or is there just some that don't? <laughs> um, well, I can take that, yeah. I mean, I think I've definitely experienced that before where like some kids like, you know, they're just not in the mood that in the mood that day to do art, but they're not in the mood to do that specific project. So I think it's always best to just like meet them where they're at, you know? And like, if they're not feeling it, then we could just give them like, you know, maybe a pencil and paper and they could just do their own thing. Um, I don't think that we should be, you know, like forcing any student to, to do out because in the end it's just, it's a process. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, they have to like discover for themselves. Um, and then, yeah, personally, I don't think that like every child is like super passionate about art, but I think that art is important because it gives you like the skills and like, you know, certain values that they could use for other disciplines. So that's why I think it's valuable. And, you know, even though every student isn't super passionate about art, it's just about being able to cultivate those skills and making sure that, you know, students understand the importance of art. Well, I want to add something. So you can always ask one or two volunteer who wants to share what they create, what they like, the title of artwork, something like that. Or so um, you can ask, just quietly point your favorite part. Then you don't need to speak. This kind of connects to um, the question that was just asked on shyness. Do you guys personally feel like COVID has made kids more shy in terms of being isolated or maybe not having social interaction? or perhaps even the opposite, more rambunctious because they just have a lot of energy to release, not being able to go in public places and all those things, or a combination of the two. Just curious. I teach kindergartners, so I imagine maybe they've not really ever even been in a classroom because they're like so young. I feel like in general, I they're all like very friendly and they play together all the time like whenever we get there they're like on the playground playing together so it does almost feel like the same as when I was in elementary school and there's like maybe one or two kids that are just like always have tons of energy like they can't sit down can't be quiet and then some kids that are just really quiet and won't talk but I feel like 
that was probably me in elementary school. So I don't know if it's like far too different. I feel like for me, the effects of COVID that I've seen, like was like when I did creative writing last semester, it was just that their like writing skills were really behind. But socially, I feel like they're still like quite okay. Well, I want to say it's very similar, but very different way. Perhaps I noticed that a lot of students are um, missing some sort of like classroom manners, perhaps like or basic classroom, like, um, you know, like common things like perhaps if I stop talking and look at you and get closer and closer, how do you feel? Do I do something wrong? <laughs> but like these days, kids, they don't know what I'm doing. Like, oh, why are you looking at me? Why you keep close? Like, they don't, yeah. So I have to use different type of like techniques to get them, yeah, get attention. So important to like to note too that the, like, the pandemic's ongoing. So I think a lot of students are like, we've had stops and starts. We've had masks on and off and like back and forth. So I think they're just like, not like frazzled, but I think they're like, it's still happening. And there's just like so much change that like they're having to roll with and teachers are having to roll with and families and parents. So I think it's like very much like ongoing and like the full effects are probably still happening and we won't really know. Um, so it's like really being, just keeping our eyes open to like all the different changes that they're continuing to, to experience. Yeah, or so some kids are, um, cause they're not used to like large classroom size cause they've been to online learning and the class size are small these days. So when we have some large classroom settings, a lot of kids get nervous and they start to chew their mask or something like, <laughs> yeah, some other behaviors. Question, one more question to wrap up. Anybody from the audience? Okay, then I'm going to pose this to you all. Um, it, and not everyone has to answer it, but, you know, um, how has CREATE as an organization impacted your time at Berkeley? Um, it's taken up a lot of my time, I must say. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm mostly kidding. Um, I would say it's um, the one organization that really helps, uh, or not helps, but it makes me feel like I'm making a difference in the community. And so it's been really important to me um, because, you know, I, I came to Berkeley to, well, you come to school to learn, right? But Create offers more than that, more to the experience than just that, right? Um, that was a bit of a frazzled summary, but um, why don't we hear from our other student teachers? Yeah, um, I, I can go. Um, yeah, it definitely has taken up a good amount of time, <laughs> I'd say. But I think overall its impact is just like giving me an opportunity to like, um, you know, get involved like beyond just like the campus. Um, cause, you know, I think that's something unique about Create is that it does like create a relationship between the community and like, you know, the Berkeley like school system and um, Cal. And I think that that's like really important to me is just like making sure to like foster that connection and making sure that like at least I have like somewhat of a role in like making sure that the university like also helps its community and not just focuses on its students. So I think I agree with like Tanya on that. It's good to like you know, it really does feel like you are making a difference. And like, even in like my like, you know, like 20 kid like classroom, um, I feel like I know all of them like really well, even though I only go there like once a week. So I feel like even just being able to like build that community, um, I think is like really a unique experience that I don't think I've been able to like get anywhere else. Um, so yeah. Um, I think it's it's definitely weird to come back on campus. Uh, I, I do it twice. I will occasionally coach my, my college improv team and I'll come back um, and then I'll do this. And it's it's very different. Uh, but like I said, it's, uh, you know, there's a reason so many indie musicians have like rich parents. Uh, Nick Kroll's parents are like fucking like oligarchs. Um, it's, it's, it's a cycle. It's, and if also, you know, if you don't see yourself represented on stage, then you don't think that could be you on stage. Um, and so it's, 
it's one thing, you know, it's nice to come back and teach my improv team because it's like, you know, all that. But this is nice because I know it has a further impact. Uh, and yeah, just like I said, starting at a young age, and especially when it's like low income kids, uh, you know, those opportunities are not usually there, especially like a fucking improv class. That shit's expensive. Um, can I curse? I it's too late. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we're running out of time, but yeah, it's just, it's nice to know that there's an impact, you know, even if it's a small, little, tiny one, it's just nice. I will say a lot of student organizations do make really observable changes, um, you know, in the world, in the local community. And um, if you like art, um, visual arts, creative writing, theater, dance, and you like teaching, then Create's just one way for you to do that. Um, Great. And yeah, so. Um, well, thank you, Create. Let's give them a round of applause for your wonderful talk today. We really appreciate it for bringing change into our community through the arts. All right. Happy Friday, everyone.